yeah so we can just get started with the presentation and if there's any trouble uh, i request prakash or nishant from coimbatore nature society to just uh, uh, give me a um, message or a call uh, to my mobile number and uh, let me know if there's an issue otherwise we'll just get started and if there are any questions uh, from the participants i'd request you to um, save it to the end because this is going to be a large audience there are about um, i think at least about 40 to 50 people attending today's uh, presentation so if you can save it to the end that will be very great thank you so much so um, getting started now we have to in this presentation um what we're going to do is like we're just going to discuss like what makes a good uh, bird picture and um, or a bird photograph so um we are not going to discuss uh, equipment or camera techniques in this presentation we are going to reserve that for a later date so what we are going to see is basically um that bird photography is a combination of both art and science and in this presentation we are going to see both uh, what are the some of the uh, scientific aspects or the technical aspects and also the artistic or the aesthetic aspects uh, in a bird photography we are not going to discuss equipment or uh, camera techniques the first message that i want to uh, tell to all my, all the viewers of today's presentation is that please give yourself time because bird photography is not something you can um, get a camera today and uh, uh, gain expertise in a week or two it takes a lot of time it takes a lot of time to understand the camera understand the lens understand the field craft understand what makes a, a good picture and to illustrate uh, what i uh, mean this is a picture i was searching in my archives for like my oldest bird um, um picture that i have in my archives what you see here is a gray headed canary flycatcher and uh, what you see on the right uh, on the left is a picture that i have taken in uh, 27 for 2014 uh, that was just about when i started with the uh, uh, bird photography and what you see on the right is something that i have taken recently uh, which is on uh, 2019 um, which is about um, a year back but between the first image and the second image draw the viewer's attention to the bird and it should tell a story so this is these are the different aspects which go into making a good bird photograph now um of this um these different aspects if you want to break it down uh, when i say sharp the bird should be like you know well focused the with the feather details visible well exposed and um, means like the bird should be in very good uh, lighting without any harsh highlights or shadows i'm going to explain about these aspects in later slides it should have like true colors the white balance uh, the contrast and the saturation should be uh, good um so these three the sharpness exposure and the you know colors these form the technical aspects of a good bird photograph and uh, the uh, drawing the attention to the bird like you know the, the picture should be well composed dominates the, uh, it should dominate the frame the, the perspective should be at eye level should be free of clutter should have like a very pleasing bokeh and uh, catch light and it should tell a story you know what is the bird doing why is it doing it so these aspects form the aesthetic or the artistic aspect of a bird photograph and we are going to discuss um, um, why certain pictures are not so good and why certain pictures are good in the following slides so before i start with the presentation and i want to start with this picture this picture was taken by me in bharatpur in uh, december of 2011 it's a picture of bar headed geese uh, three of them flying so uh, the question i have for uh, viewers today is that 
is this a good bo uh, bird photograph and um, uh, why or why not so this is what the presentation is going to deal with basically so first we are going to look at the technical aspects and um, later on we are going to switch to the artistic or aesthetic aspects uh, before we start um, because i live in an area where the internet connectivity is a little poor there might be some disruptions in the uh, in the meeting uh, please bear with me um, so um, we'll uh, get on with the presentation now um, so first thing is the focus you know between the first the photograph on the left and the photograph on the right the only thing is like uh, what has happened is that uh, this was a picture of this uh, jungle bush quails um, um, this is the male jungle bush quail in the uh, picture on the left i had kept the focus point on the shoulder of the bird because of which uh, the eye of the bird got out of focus and uh, picture on the right where the focus point is correct uh, the eye of the bird is in focus so you can almost like every other aspect in a photograph you can fix but if the focus is not right then it makes for a unusable photograph so the focus and particularly for a bird photograph or a wildlife photograph the focus should be on the eye and the focus should be very sharp unless like the eye is sharp the it really ruins the photograph so second aspect of this uh, presentation is that um, exposure you know uh, often times when we are photographing birds uh, when we see birds we are very excited we want to photograph them immediately we don't pay, pay attention to you know um, where the sun is um, uh, what the metering mode is all these things we don't pay attention to so it is important that the bird should be well lit for a good uh, bird photograph um, so that is like a very important aspect so the the one on the right the the photograph is like uh, well exposed but then uh, it's a very dull day uh, where there are no uh, features on the sky but um, at least on the exposure point of view with respect to the bird it's okay so second thing is highlights so the highlights uh, are like you know um, what happens is like when you're often uh, photographing a bird uh, which is in a shade and there's like a spot of light um, falling on the bird what happens is the highlights or the bright areas of the image um, get overexposed and um, sometimes like in this image uh, where the uh, the highlights are overexposed you are able to recover the highlights but often times what happens is when you, the highlights are blown out it's it's impossible to recover the details um, from the highlights so um, it becomes a big problem so it, it it's uh, it's always it pays to pay attention to these things on the field itself in the next presentation um, uh, i think in the following week or the week after we're going to deal with like the camera techniques i'm going to discuss about like you know um, aspects like um, how um, the the bird is going to be uh, how we can control the highlights how we can control the um, shadows and other things but uh, for this presentation just we are going to focus on what makes a good image um, so uh, the one on the right is like the good image um, so and um, uh, shadows and the exposure are like related aspects um, you know what happens is like when you're uh, photographing you know like you know you know where like the bird is under the shade of a branch or uh, the canopy above the bird uh, tends to be like with uh, very little um, very little um, the, the bird's features are not very visible so the one um, on the left is a very poorly lit image because it's in shadow areas the one on the right um, is like a, an okay image 
where you can, you have like you know opened up the shadows but what happens is like um, when you are opening up the shadows what happens is the noise in the image also goes up so whereas like when you want to increase the exposure uh, in let's say post processing when you are increasing the exposure the the noise level in the image does not go up and uh, well whereas when you are opening up the shadows the noise level in the photograph goes up because most of the cameras available now are iso invariant images where like increasing the exposure doesn't increase the noise level in the um, in the picture but whereas the opening up the shadows increases the noise level so it's important to get the image correct while you are uh, in the field um, some of these uh, photographs are recoverable in post processing so the other important thing um, in the technical aspect is like reproducing colors correctly and uh, the image on the left if you see um, it has like a, it was take, taken early morning i think it was about 7:30 am um um 7:30 am and because of which it, the image has like a very blue cast uh, to it um and uh, the image on the right the colors are uh, reproduced correctly now if the image was taken with a jpeg format instead of a raw format uh, achieving this change would have been very difficult it is possible to some extent to collect color correct the colors in a jpeg image but not as simple as correcting it in a raw image so when you're taking like bird pictures um this is a suggestion that you should always try to take it in a raw format and uh, do the post processing uh, to co uh, correct for the errors so if you look at it uh, look at the technical aspects except for focus or sharpness of an image most of the technical errors can be fixed in post processing so blown out highlights of course are impossible to fix in post processing some cases for the highlights are like you know um, you can fix it but in most cases it's impossible so it's important to get it right in the field itself uh, second uh, third thing important thing is like uh, opening up shadows results in a very high amount of noise in the picture so um, uh, get your metering right in the picture uh, while shooting the bird uh don't try to fix it in post processing uh because you might be left with a unusable image so and the, and the final thing is like uh always shoot in raw format to fix these errors most of them are recoverable except for like focus and um, highlights to some extent you can so um, color cast all these things you can uh, fix it in post processing yeah so is this uh, i hope it is being uh, um i am being clear to the audience if there's any questions up until this point um i can take a question um otherwise i can continue with the presentation are there any questions should i just continue uh, balaji you have a one we have one question in chat uh, you can see that yeah one second yeah so what uh, one of the person has um um asked what exactly is opening up the shadows um see actually this is something that has, that has to do with the post processing once you taken the image um and uh, you uh, work on a software like lightroom or the photoscape or photoshop you can um, uh, do this we are not going to uh, deal with uh, um, these aspects now we'll save it for a different presentation just stay with me to understand this presentation is exclusively focusing on uh, what makes a good picture and because you know when i was working in uh, automotive company one of my boss used to tell me that no why is always more important than no how because no why is like a little more difficult answer like why uh, 
why a certain picture is good why a certain picture is bad so knowing a why or uh, knowing what makes a good picture is more essential and that's what we are going to focus here and we are going to cover that uh, opening up the shadows in a later uh, presentation and i'll be um, it will be another presentation like this so it will be open to all the participants it will be free of cost of course so uh, please uh, reserve that for that this question for that presentation yeah so uh, satish has asked uh, please explain about highlights so if you go and look at this presentation the you know say um, the light where the light is falling on the bird uh, where the, it's, it's created like a bright spot that is exactly the highlight and uh, the uh, technically called a highlight in an image um, and sometimes uh, it doesn't make for a very pleasing picture and um, sometimes it can be fixed in post processing sometimes it's not uh, it's important to um, try not to blowing out the highlights and in fact uh, there are some camera techniques uh, you can use to avoid highlights so uh, we'll move on to the artistic aspects or the aesthetic aspects of the bird mm. Uh, one sec yeah so i think the first uh, most important thing in artistic aspect is that um, you should not crop parts of a bird's body while photographing a bird uh, for example this is a racket tail drongo and um, what's happened on the picture on the right is the tail is cropped from the picture because like i was having the camera in a horizontal format so in in these cases um what we can do is like we can try um um rotating the camera to a vertical format and try taking the image the, between the both the images i think uh, there were like um a few um, minutes or uh, one or two minutes difference between the first and second image and the bird was still in that um a perch it just like flipped over to the other side i was having the camera in a vertical format and we should be able to move the focus of a point so that the eye of the bird is captured sharply so um i think this aspect is very important um but some photographers prefer to have like you know uh, the head shot of the bird where like if you there's a raptor and if you just focus on the eye and the other details of the bird it makes for a pleasing image uh, yes i do accept but um, by and large we should try to have the uh, bird reproduced in its full without cropping any parts of the body so um, so this is one basic aspect and uh, while composing an image uh, we should always try to avoid what is called as the dead center that is like placing the bird in the center of the frame we should always have the uh, more space in the direction where the bird is looking and uh, in my images what i try to do is uh, i try to leave less space below the tail and more space above the head of the bird and um, so and uh, all more space on on the direction where the bird is looking so you should always try to avoid dead center of course like if you have like a larger frame you can always um do the cropping in post processing to improve the composition but some cases it's not possible because there's there may not be enough space uh, enough uh, of an image to crop so uh, you should always uh, play attention to this aspect of avoiding the dead center because it doesn't make for a dynamic uh, picture um so again like a lot of people uh, say this is the uh, this has the rule of thirds uh, where when you when you uh, when you generally um, follow this like when leaving less space below the tail and more space above the head and, and the direction where the bird is looking uh, what happens is you get the eye in the direction where the grid lines are joining so um 
so it makes for a very pleasing composition uh, generally uh, for portraits it makes for a very uh, pleasing and a dynamic or a lively image uh, by the way this is uh, like a blue throated blue fly catcher photographed in tatekad so again i think the same applies to a bird in flight uh, when you try to photograph a bird in flight you should always leave space in the direction where the bird is flying um, whereas in the picture on the left there is not much room um, in the direction where the bird is flying so it, um, i mean i think um, it doesn't make for a pleasing image so this is something that we should keep it in mind uh, we should always leave room in the uh, direction where the bird is looking or flying so this is called positive space so but there is an exception to this rule of course like when when you are photographing owls or raptors where they are uh, like you know typically looking straight at the photographer and looking straight at you you can place the uh, bird at the center of the image because uh, um where like you know this was a brown fish owl uh, shot in uh, chinar so where the bird is like looking straight at you so here you can place the bird in center of the frame there is nothing wrong in this image so it makes for a uh, pleasing image so this is an exception to the rule uh, but um, when the bird is looking away you should always like try to uh, uh, provide more space in the direction where the bird is looking and the other important aspect is like the size of the bird in the frame um, now certain photographers they prefer to show um, to keep the bird small in the frame and show um more of the you know uh, habitat of the bird but in this picture what has happened is like there is nothing about the habitat is really visible and um, so you can crop uh, the bird so that the bird occupies at least one third of the image and uh, you provide more space in the direction where the bird is looking so um this makes for a very pleasing picture and it birds the uh, fills the frame the details of the bird is uh, visible the people are able to connect with the bird better so this would be like um, another important aspect of course like in an it is an article artistic choice uh, i mean like if you want to show more of the habitat that's entirely up to you and it's uh, valid and wonderful as well but um mostly i like i prefer to it's a personal preference i like to uh, have the bird occupy one third of the frame and again like when you are composing images um when you are shooting birds like particularly uh, those near uh, water bodies like uh, eurasian coot or common coot which is seen here um the you should not uh, you know avoid the reflections because reflections form the uh, a part of the image itself so you should treat the reflections of the bird as a unit in the bird itself and again like provide more space on um, above the bird and then the direction um, uh, where the bird is looking so the one on the right um, is the correct composition for this image um so this is something to keep in mind when you are shooting in water bodies again in water bodies what uh, typically happens is like this uh, ruddy shell duck was uh, shot in mangal jodi uh, but it, the bird was very close to our boat and uh, but what has happened is like in my um, anxiety to shoot the bird uh, what has happened is like the water level um if you see that the water it looks like it's flowing from left to right which is not the case um it's a large lake largely still there's no um, much water flow there um so uh, um, what you have to ensure in post processing is that the water level is like at even um position and uh, so it really makes for a pleasing image this is another aesthetic aspect so again i think uh, with, uh, this is a very similar point with respect to um, when you are shooting in um, landscape shots or like where you are trying to um, 
shoot ground uh, living birds where it's important to have like a level ground um because like uh, the picture the viewers uh, is all, all always trying to complete the picture and he's always trying to you know caucus uh, he or she is going to caucus head and see like um um if the the picture is level or not so if you do that um for him in post processing it will make his job easier it makes for a more pleasing image yeah um Jamana. so what has happened is like um i have uh, this Jamana. there was like not much space for uh, correcting the levels in the image so what has happened is the tail portion of the bird has got cropped in the right side so um, uh, we should always pay attention to the horizons and uh, the water levels in the field itself and in fact in the cameras most of the cameras available there are some features which you can enable to make sure that the camera does it um, you are able to see the uh, the level of the camera in the viewfinder itself which i which i won't be talking in this presentation we will be talking it in the future presentations so the other important aesthetic aspect is that we should always try to photograph wild birds um, in their natural habitat so you sh we should try and avoid man made objects to the best possible and like uh, for example uh, this bird was uh, sitting on a concrete fence although like um, uh, technically the lighting and um, the other aspects are uh, okay with this picture the one i'd prefer the one on the right because it is sitting on a natural perch so we should always try and um, photograph birds in their natural uh, habitats and we should avoid the man made uh, objects and um, this is a, this is something that i try to follow uh, most of the time where uh, if you ever want to have your uh, pictures published in a field guide we should uh, make sure that the picture um, shows all the identification features of the bird correctly so uh, what we see here is a jerdon's bush lark and between jerdon's bush lark and the indian bush lark the important id feature is the that the jerdon's bush lark has a very long hind toe nail um so which is not visible in the picture on the left um Uh, the same bird same perch uh, taken 2 uh, seconds later the uh, when it's about to call it just lifts its leg where the hind toe nail is captured beautifully so uh, this is something that i i always like prefer to have like uh, the the features of the bird visible uh, entirely at least the identif important identification uh, aspects we should not miss so this is another aspect we should keep in mind um so this is um this is uh, both the birds are um, uh, lesser uh, i mean sorry uh, eurasian kestrels or the common kestrels which is very similar to the uh, lesser kestrel now the picture in the left why is it better than the picture in the right is because the important identification feature between the both i mean uh, the uh, the toenail uh, in the common kestrel is black in color and the other thing is like the wing tip reaches the tail tip in lesser kestrel whereas in common kestrel it falls short so on the picture on the left both the uh, toenails are um, not visible the wing tip is also not visible so this is not a picture i'd like to share um, on birding forums but i'd rather share a picture like the the one on the right because the toenails are visible and the um the wing tip uh, falls short of the tail tip so both these uh, identification features are clearly visible on the picture on the right so this why uh, the picture on the right is better so another aesthetic aspect is that uh, 
we should try to have the big uh, parallel to the camera sensor so this is because like um, let's say you are uh, photographing uh, uh, woodpeckers and uh, the beak is um, away and you try to photograph uh, that bird the true length of the beak is is not conveyed to the viewer um and the and the viewer is also not able to connect with the bird because the bird is looking away whereas the picture on the right the bird uh, eye is uh, perfectly visible the beak is perfectly parallel so the the, uh, the viewer is able to instantly connect with the bird on the right so this is another aesthetic um, aspect that i uh, i usually uh, take care of when i'm photographing the bird this is an andaman bulbul which is taken in uh, the um, little andamans uh, so both the pictures were taken a few seconds apart so it's important to you know um, uh, sort of take multiple shots of the bird um, because the birds always doing something uh, you can um, miss um, a critical position so so taking like four or five shots uh, when everything else is perfect is always a good idea okay so now is an important aspect which we call the perspective so the picture on the left is like of the white rump shama uh, where we are uh, this was taken in chinnar where we are um, um, we are down below and the bird is on top so the we okay uh, so i think we are going to the presentation is going to be interrupted in another 10 minutes so uh, what i'd like you to do is like please sign in with the same uh, login credentials if the meeting gets ended please log in with the same credentials so that uh, uh, we can continue with the uh, same presentation um, it's just like a 40 limit uh, 40 minute time limit that the zoom call has sorry about it so um, coming back to perspective so when you are looking you are below and the bird is above and you take a shot of the bird doesn't make for a very pleasing image the, the viewer is not able to connect with the bird because the, the bird is at a higher level whereas the bird in the next image the um, the bird is at eye level all the identification points are visible you are able to instantly connect with the bird and get into the bird's uh, world so it makes for a very uh, pleasing image but you uh, most of you will have a question like uh, okay but uh, you know getting a bird by itself is so rare um how do we get it at eye level uh, is another question that most people have there's one small technique you can try to in um, adopt which i'll share in another slide so this was a illustration by dr caesar sangupta he has shared an article called simple tips for to help newcomers make board uh, bird photographs uh, it was published in the classic imaging magazine and i've given the ma the uh, issue details so if people are interested they can get the magazine and see but this is what the technique uh, basically says so the the person on the right um, is too close to the bird so he will get a picture like the one on the right here um one on the one on the left here but when you take a few steps back the the angle between the you know uh, the sensor and the bird reduces to 10 or 15 degree whereas the one on the right where the angle is like at 45 degree so um, when it is at 10 or um, 15 degrees uh, the i mean um, it, you can you can't make out whether the bird is at eye level or at slightly higher so it, it still makes for a, a very pleasing image so i suggest you try it in the field So another thing about the perspective is that uh, uh, this is like the same um, shot, shot eared out. The, one, the image on the left is at, um, taken from the vehicle and the image on the right is taken from the ground where I was lying on the ground and taking the shot. So uh, what happens in this image is that when you're sitting down or like, you know, um, taking the uh, picture of the bird from higher up uh, 
the background of the bird becomes the ground uh, whereas like if you are lying down and uh, taking the picture the background becomes infinity and it provides like a you know, good separation between the bird and the background and it makes for a very pleasing image you get the uh, the bokeh uh, effect of this bird so you should always try to um, take a low level shot uh, of this bird which makes for a pleasing image so to illustrate this point i'll share a couple of images again because this is a very important point so this is a ruddy turn stone um the image on the left was taken in uh, sri lanka where uh, we were on the safari vehicle we saw the uh, uh, ruddy turn stone on the uh, on the ground feeding on the ground and i took this image uh, whereas the the one on the right was taken in uh, greater run of kutch um, in the mandavi beach where uh, we were lying on the seashore to uh, take the image so you can see what big difference it makes um to the picture the one on the right is a very pleasing picture uh, with a beautiful separation between the background and the bird and the bokeh um, is also very, um, very uh, good so it makes for a very pleasing image and now um, you may ask you know like it, um, sometimes the ground is slushy there's a lot of um, you know dirt on the ground i don't want to lie on the ground what do i do uh, i still want to get a, a great picture so how do i do it well um, it so happens that there's like a small trick that you can uh, do or it has to do with your camera selection you can choose a camera which has like a flip out screen like the one that is shown in the picture so what you can do is like without you getting on the ground you can just like flip the screen um put the camera near the ground um, and the have it on live view so you will be able to um, focus on the bird see what you are photographing and then take the picture so you can avoid lying on the ground uh, using a flip out screen in the camera but if your camera does not have a flip out screen then this is not something you can do but this has to do with your uh, camera selection okay so the other important aspect is that we should always try and avoid clutter in the images so uh, the uh, the bird that is in the picture here is like a malabar wood shrike and there's a lot of clutter both in the foreground and also in the background and um, whereas the image on the right was taken in um, same bird uh, taken in sirwani during the hsbc bird race um so um, where the there's no clutter in this image uh there's beautiful uh, background separation the bird is highlighted the uh, so it's a the bird is also sharp so even though like the bird on the left is also sharp and all the other aspects are satisfied the bird on the right uh, the picture on the right is uh, more pleasing to the eye so we should always try to uh, avoid clutter and um, again like uh, a bokeh Uh, even though both the uh, birds are like very uh, sharply focused the eye um, eye is very sharply focused the further details are visible um, the picture on the right is better because of um, that it has like a very pleasing bokeh there's a very good uh, background foreground separation in the bird Uh, so bokeh is something that we should always trying to achieve in uh, bird photographs um but some people prefer the picture on the le left because um it shows the habitat of the bird um so that is also fine i mean this is um, it's a, just a, like a subjective notion that uh, the picture on the right is uh, better so so we I'm, i'm going to share like couple of ways in which you can achieve bokeh you know photograph so first has to do with having a wide aperture so if your lens if your camera lens allows for f4 or f5.6 um, which is the widest uh, aperture in your camera you should always try to shoot a, with the widest aperture possible so which go uh, which um, which blurs out the background 
and the foreground so which which shows the only the bird the eye of the bird in sharp focus that's like a, it shows in a very good separation so you should have like a wide aperture that is point number 1 and if the distance to the subject and distance from the subject to the background um if the distance from the subject to the background is more then i'd prefer to take the uh, um picture in that kind of a situation so which will provide for a very pleasing bokeh now this is not always possible uh, um, let me agree i mean um, but what is more important is uh, we should always also always know when to take a picture and when not to take a picture because red went red whiskered bulbuls red vented bulbuls all these birds you will get very frequently you, in the, if you visit any hill station uh, you will get them very frequently i get worked up on uh, a bird which is sitting in a clutter uh, so you have to wait for an opportunity where it comes in a place and sits in a place where there's a very good separation between the the bird and the background and then take the shot so that is what is critical uh, here so and another uh, uh, pleasing thing about um, uh, you know uh, photography uh, in general uh, not just birds wild animals even people if you looking for a natural frame for example it looks like the red whiskered bulbul uh, on the left and the um, a himalayan bulbul on the right are being you know Uh, been encircled by a natural frame this was not synthetic it just like uh, uh, naturally happens so whenever the, this uh, there is this frame you should always uh, try to uh, take a picture so it makes for a very pleasing picture so another important thing aesthetic aspect is the catch light so when you are taking photographs um if the, the catch light is nothing but a reflection of the light in the eyes of the bird uh the uh, if you look at this uh, red colored dove this was a picture was taken in andamans the one on the left and the one on the right the main difference in my opinion is the catch light on the eye so when the bird is able to um, i mean the, the reflection of the bird is visible um it makes for a very pleasing uh, picture and makes the birds lively so we should always try to take pictures where it shows the catch light um you know in post processing it is possible to uh, you know create an effect of a catch light but i don't do that uh, in my pictures i try to uh, take pictures where there's a natural catch light on the bird's eye so uh, that's something to keep in mind and uh, there's another aspect called as the specular highlights so what is specular highlights uh, specular highlights are uh, you know for example if you look at this image the bright branches behind the bird which is like, this bird is like a palni laughing thrush so there's the bright leaves on the background of the image the bright branches on the background of the uh, bird which is a little distracting so as much as possible we have to uh, avoid um, taking pictures where there are a lot of specular highlights whereas the same bird a few seconds later came um, came and sat on a branch which was uh, um, where the background was like you know it didn't have like as many bright leaves as the uh, picture on the left so this makes for a very pleasing image so specular highlights are something that we should pay pay attention to um if you are uh, trying to photograph a bird again like uh, we have seen like uh, portraits of birds now we are going to see few aspects while photographing the birds in flight um so when you are photo photographing birds in flight uh, we should always try and photograph birds which are like you know either coming towards us or or flying parallelly to the camera sensor so when the bird is flying away from us the eye of the bird is first of all not visible 
and uh, what you see is like uh, the rump of the bird which is uh, which is not a pleasing image at all um so you always try to photograph birds coming in or uh flying parallel to the camera sensor so that makes for a pleasing image again like um, when photographing birds this is like a northern pintail which was photographed by me in um, mangala jodi wetlands uh, it, um, both the images are like very good flight shots uh, sharp from wing tip to wing tip uh, all the details there's a beautiful catch light beautiful uh, background of course like a featureless sky but um, but otherwise like uh, there's no distraction in the image but what has happened is like the wing of the bird itself hides uh, the some of the uh, features of the bird so i'd prefer the picture on the right because the wing is in the upward uh, swing and it reveals more of the bird than it hides um so this is like a personal preference um i mean i think uh, some people like to show the um, features on the wing uh, interesting features on the wing uh, itself so they like to photograph well it is on the downward stroke uh, that is also fine it's like a subjective thing um i prefer trying to take pictures on the uh, right like the ones on the right so um again like when you are taking a bird uh, this is called like a belly shot where you are uh, down below and the bird is flying high above and uh, and uh, in the in the case of the image on the left which is like a bonalis eagle juvenile um it was a very dull sky um i mean i think uh, it was a very cloudy sky there's absolutely no features in the sky so uh, it doesn't make for a very pleasing image and there was another uh, reason why this is not preferred it really messes with the the camera's exposure metering system i'll be dealing with those aspects technical uh, the camera aspects in a later presentation but um, uh, from a purely aesthetic point of view a cloudy sky does not make for a good background so if at all uh, you get like let's say black kite or a brahmani kite against a, like a dull sky please don't take that image uh, if you want you can take but uh, it doesn't make for a pleasing image so the one on the right where it's a clear blue sky um it makes for a very pleasing um, image so this is something that uh, you should try to uh, take again when you're photographing flock of birds um both the, uh, these are eurasian oyster catchers uh, again taken in greater run of kutch in the mandavi beach um in the first image image on the left it, it looks like the birds are like you know flying into each other they are about to crash because they are one of the um, the wing of one bird covers the other um so it doesn't make for a pleasing image so the image on the right on the other hand where there's a very beautiful separation between the birds so this is what um you should try to uh, photograph when you are photographing a flock of birds in flight okay um so the next important thing is like we have seen how to photograph or like why certain birds why certain bird photographs are more pleasing than the others so now more importantly than the portraits or bird and flight shots we have to take photographs which tell a story but uh, what story can a bird photograph tell and so basically we have to take pictures when bird is doing something like when it's let's say calling uh, cleaning its feathers which is called preening when it's bathing in water when it's feeding when it's engaged in um, some kind of courtship display collecting nesting material nest building defending um feeding fledglings engaged in some sort of a distraction display uh, all these make for very interesting uh, bird pictures and some of the other stories that people like to capture is what is happening to the bird uh, what is happening to the habitat of the bird what is some unusual behavior that they are seeing in a bird so these make for very good stories so i'm going to share some examples uh, that's going to make the last part of this presentation 
So uh, this happens to be a, a yellow-billed babbler, and um, it's in the middle of some interesting action. I want you to uh, unmute your mics and uh, microphones, and you can tell me like what do you think the bird is doing? Anybody? Is it basking? Is it basking? Um, no, not really. It's not basking. So they do this uh, kind of a behavior where they rapidly flutter their wings and uh, make um, a lot of noises. Is it courtship behavior? No, it's not a courtship behavior. Alarm, uh, alarm uh, signal? Excuse me? Is it like an alarm call? Alarm uh, call. Unwanted visitor has come. <laughs> Correct. Uh, you are right, actually. The bird is uh, what is called as a sentinel. So when, uh, when you're, you always find this yellow-billed babblers, or like most babblers in general, they always like, um, uh, they are uh, feeding in flocks. So one bird acts like a sentinel, which is like a guardian, which goes and sits on top of uh, some place and looks for dangers, like let's say a cat on the prowl, a snake, um, whatever. And then it, it warns the other birds by rapidly fluttering its wings and making its call. So uh, this is called a sentinel uh, behavior. And uh, this you can see in most of the babblers. So this is what in the, this bird is uh, doing. So it makes for a very interesting um, picture because you can talk um, something about the picture. Other than, you know, let's say um, the idea of the bird, of course, like people will know, but then uh, this behavior is something that most people are not aware of. Okay, I, th I think um, this is something that most uh, people would have uh, realized uh, that the bird, most of the birds are not aware of their reflections. They don't, th they don't know that, um, um, you know, when they look in a mirror, they think that it's uh, another bird on the other side and they start pecking at it. But uh, you can capture that um, photograph and, uh, you know, uh, tell your own story. For example, you can say that, you know, the male uh, house sparrow is sitting on top, waiting impatiently for the female to... No, stop looking at the mirror and uh, uh, getting ready, okay, before going out. So, so it makes for a very funny picture. So, so this is like a white-bellied um, blue flycatcher, one of the endemics of Western Ghats. So it's like um, it's a very low-light shot, but it's it's taking bath, and um, you can see the droplets uh, flying everywhere. Uh, it makes for a, even though like it's a very, uh, you can see the noise on the screen, it, it's not like a technically a super image, but then it, um, it's visually very interesting because the bird is in the middle of an action. And you can always like uh, take a sequence of shots, uh, like the one here. This is a common Iora, a male in a beautiful breeding plumage. And actually, the way that I took the sequence was because I was trying to get a good picture of the um, common Iora in a, of the male in a breeding plumage, which normally we don't get. And uh, a few seconds later, I saw that the bird has um, found a caterpillar and was uh, um, about to eat it. So it uh, made for like very uh, interesting sequence of uh, pictures. So uh, these sequence of pictures also tell a story. So this also makes it very interesting for the uh, viewers. And this is like a puff-throated babbler taken in Tatekat, where it was like eating. So uh, the bird is like, you know, uh, in a gorgeous light, um, beautiful background. Um, it's sharp. Uh, but the most interesting thing about the image is not all these aspects, but then uh, in the process of taking and consuming a worm, which makes it interesting for the viewers. And it's uh, relatable to humans. So this is like, uh, you know, a blue-tailed beater, 
which was taken in, um, uh, I think it was in Point Kalama, inside the sanctuary where uh, the blue tailed beater was on the ground, which was like, you know, the process of eating this uh, dragonfly, which is just caught. So it's interesting to um, see what it eats. So it, which makes it interesting, uh, relatable to humans. So this makes for a beautiful picture. And um, this is like, um, it may look like the birds are fighting, but it, in fact, uh, the black shouldered kites uh, in the picture, it's the male on the top and the female on the bottom. In fact, uh, we, this is a very sexually dimorphic, uh, it's not a sexually dimorphic species. You can't really tell in the field whether it's a male or a female, but uh, uh, what happens is like, it's a part of a courtship behavior where the female um, flips over and presents its talents to the male and they do this uh, sort of a cartwheeling uh, kind of a thing. Uh, this part of its courtship. So uh, this is makes for a interesting story again. Um, again, this was, uh, this was a sequence of pictures which I had taken when I was starting photography. The picture is not very great. A lot of portions of the picture is like, you know, cropped out, um, it's, it's blurry and all those. But in, 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 this is um, a pair of peacocks, the male and the female, uh, they are mating. They were mating in the, um, an open field um, uh, where I go for birding regularly. I was able to, fortunate enough to witness this. There are some uh, people who believe that uh, peacocks are celebrate, uh, celibate animals. So, <laughs> so I want them to see this picture. <clears throat> so, um, what do you think this uh, yellow-throated bulbul is doing? Anybody? Is eating. No, it's not eating. So I think uh, collecting the nest material. It sticks to nest. Yeah, yeah, it's collecting nesting material because this is a gulmoha tree, and this sticks is not something it feeds on. It was using it for its nest, so it makes for an interesting story. And this is like um, a tailor bird, which was uh, which had nested. Uh, in our um, in our house, so I was fortunate to get capture this on camera. Um, so it's a this is the kind of nest which a tailor bird makes. But uh, um, but some of the online forums like you know Indian birds and other, they don't allow nesting pictures. So uh, you should be careful about where you are posting them, what the rules are. So most of the online forums they don't permit. Uh, posting nesting pictures because they believe that it is going to, you know, disturb the bird and, uh, you know, reveal its location, the nest location to others. So that's why like this was like taken two years back, uh, long after the nest was gone and was abandoned. Um, I had, I'm now sharing this image. So this is like a common miner's nest. It's uh, feeding, I think it's uh, um, the fruit of the neem tree which is feeding to its young ones. Um, so this is always like the nesting images are like interesting, but please don't disturb the image because the very fact that you're photographing the nest of the bird attracts predators to it. So some of, sometimes when the birds um, detect that um, the nest has been discovered, it abandons the nest and abandons its fledglings. So uh, if you, if at all you want to photograph a nest, Make sure that you are well hidden and uh, you make sure that no other predators are nearby and you don't share the images when the nest is active. So that's something that you have to keep in mind. So this was a um, beautiful image which I had taken in, um, this was in uh, Sikkim, a place called Pelling, where purely by chance we came across this birds, this scene where the greenback tit, uh, the parent was feeding uh, a worm to the child. So it makes for a very interesting image. But more interesting is like, um, uh, then that is this uh, 
velvet fronted nuthatches so the velvet fronted nuthatches as you all know it always walks um, upside down on trees so you see the parent is down below and the chick is up above and then it is taking the um, feed from the food from the parent sitting upside down so uh, you know i mean um, it's at least very interesting to me to watch because um, um a bird taking food upside down because the entire gra- the digestive system works on the gravity so this is something very interesting which i encountered in kodaikanal uh, a few years back so this again i think um, i can tell me what is happening in this image what is the bird protecting its chicks the chicks are hiding under the belly yes 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 no, so yes. protecting its chicks yeah this image was taken in kalangal where kalangal is like a very good uh, breeding ground for uh, yellow wattle lapwings so this image was like taken like uh, some 4 years back where um, uh the you know, the yellow wattle lapwing was uh, um, protecting its uh, chicks i think there were three or four of them underneath it sitting underneath it it's just like using its uh, wings to conceal them so for a passer by it looks like just this yellow wattle lapwing is uh, sitting but then it's hiding its chicks underneath so <clears throat> this is another interesting story uh can somebody tell me what is happening in this image and what bird this is white tide no this is like a long legged buzzard so this is this happens to be i think the i mean the second or third record for entire state of tamil nadu the earlier record was with the parameshwaran sir gajamohan and team who had visited uh, my village to um, to record the uh, european ruler uh, european roller and they incidentally cited uh, this long legged buzzard and subsequently i photographed this bird but the story that it um, i think it tells this image tells us that is sitting there whereas like the on the background is like a land which was previously uh, scrub jungle uh, all the bright uh, stones that you see here are like the demarcation stones for uh, sites so um, the entire scrub jungle is gone its habitat is gone and now uh, it is being developed as a real estate so i think um, is looking for its prey it's looking for its habitat i think <laughs> yeah so yeah it might be looking for its prey as well um, so this is another it is image. a visitor it can't be looking for its habitat yeah but it uh, it might be previously visiting this uh, uh, habitat for years together and finally now it has no roosting space it just has to sit on this fencing stone previously it might have been roosting on trees but where are the trees the trees are gone uh, and it's placed as this fencing stone so in this picture it's a greater uh, painted snipe uh, this is the female in the snipes the female is more attractive than the male um, in this picture what ha- what is what we are seeing is like this Uh, picture was uh, for people from Coimbatore. Uh, they might know this wetland, Krishna Mbadi, Krishna Mbadi, which is near that sugarcane breeding institute. Uh, what must have been once pristine uh, wetlands is now a dumping yard. So all um, you see a lot of plastic waste uh, now um, uh, in the place where, which was once a beautiful habitat for this uh, painted snipes. so we should always talk, we should always convey that this is happening uh, to the bird we should always not only try to take attractive pictures of the bird but we should always uh, try to convey what is happening to the bird what is happening to its habitat so that we are able to um, make more people aware 
about uh, the challenges and become they become more sensitive to these uh, things so <clears throat> um the final part of the presentation is like i want to uh, share some unusual stories um so i um <clears throat> i saw this um, this is a paddy field pipit and i saw this bird in uh, mangala jodi can somebody tell me what is so unusual about this picture uh, it behaves like uh, uh, indian robin like uh, actually the it is lifting its tail uh, upwards correct correct absolutely right so actually uh, pipits if you see they never lift their tails they usually have the tails on the ground and then uh, walks around with the tail on the ground it never lifts its uh, tail upwards i have never seen pipits do this but this pipit was doing this but it was not a indian robin it was trying to imitate it was like a blue throat it was trying to imitate so blue throat was also there uh, nearby it was always uh, walking around with its tail lifted up so it was a blue throat it was trying to Im Im uh, imitate and uh, paddy field pipits are not known to mimic other birds so this was something uh, very unusual but this is a kind of um, uh, things which are like have like a special uh, interest for bird watchers so another uh, unusual thing what i saw was this um, black kite uh so the black kite normally what it does is it takes it's a scavenger it takes uh, the food from it takes uh, uh, the food in its talons goes and rests in some place and then feeds it leisurely so uh, when i visited this place called ponnani beach that's where the bardapula river meets the ocean i saw this um, black kite feeding fish when it was flying which was very unusual to me which has never seen this behavior before um so i decided to take this shot so this is something of interest for the bird watchers so um that's it folks so um, um thank you so much uh, for your patient listening i hope uh, these presentation was useful to you and i look forward to um, for some great stories from all of you happy birthday so and now we are open to questions please do um, ask questions i think we can take like a four a four quest four or five questions and then we'll uh, wind it up uh, balaji you can see one uh, a question from yeah. jayanti raj yeah one second uh, let me just check the chat okay okay the meeting will end in 10 minutes so okay uh jayanti raj can we explain what is clutter clutter is basically um, things which are like you know um if you if there is a lot of leaves or sticks in front of a bird um i think somebody is uh, okay let me just go back to that slide where i yeah so if you look at this uh, picture on the left you can see a lot of leaves in the front so it's like disturbing the image so uh, and the uh, leaves are also in the background um so it is a little distracting uh, for, uh, it is uh, taking the attention away from the bird so i think this um, this is um the picture on the right on the other hand there are no distracting leaves in the foreground or the background everything is beautifully uh, blurred there is a good background separation so the picture on the right is what i'd uh, prefer over um the picture on the left and balaji the first question you asked uh, everyone actually please uh, You yeah. Can, uh, <laughs> Thanks for that asking that question, for... Prakash. Mm -hmm. I'm going to answer it right away. Yes, yes. Yeah. So yeah. I was, um, yeah, I was having like this picture of like the flock of birds in flight. So in this picture, um, 
if you see the wing is like hiding the uh, features of the bird uh, below um so i wouldn't prefer this picture uh, uh, earlier like when i uh, the, when i took this picture um, in 2014 i was under the impression that this is the greatest photo ever taken um uh, and like this a perfect image and i've shared it on social media even uh, several days before but right now if you ask me uh while this might be like a good picture i feel like you know the picture uh, one second uh a picture like this is more preferable where like the birds are beautifully separated from each other and like uh, uh, so basically this was like a flock of birds the feature of one bird is hiding the feature of the other so that's the reason why um i don't think this is like a good enough picture based on my present standards tomorrow if i take a picture and like which is better than the picture here that might be better but that is that's okay that's the process of uh, photographer's evolution that's fine but um, at the moment i feel that like you know um, this is not a good picture but it was a not a good picture but it shows the behavior of the birds how they fly no but it shows the behavior of the birds yeah yeah sure i mean i think uh, that's always there i mean every picture has like certain value to what it might document some unusual behavior it might document certain aspect every may be hiding it may be hiding the feature of the other bird yeah but the other two birds next are visible hmm. and they fly together yeah so but today i prefer like so it is uh, a good photograph yeah. only yeah any other questions from the participants can you give us a any quick answer? overview of the gear that you use yeah so actually i use um, uh, i have like changed several gears um i presently use a nikon uh, d5 and a nikkor d500 um most of the time but when i'm on safaris i prefer my nikon d7200 with a 200 to 500 mm lens uh, which i also have so the reason why i prefer uh, a tele i mean um, a zoom lens over a fixed telephoto is that uh while you're photographing mammals while you are on a safari vehicle you never know like how close you will be coming to a mammal it might uh, walk right next to you while you are having like a fixed telephoto lens like a 500 mm f4 you can't take a picture uh, because it is like the the animal is like closer than your minimal focal distance so um you have to take a picture with your mobile camera or you will have to use like a, um, a zoom camera so um that's uh, yeah so and i think there's one other question here on the chat is there a best time of the bird that bird photographers prefer yes i think uh, mr babu chinnasamy has asked this question yeah it's usually um um preferable to um, take pictures earlier in the day like um, morning 6 to 9 is a, a very good time where the birds have rested the previous night they are very hungry very thirsty so they have to go out to find food or water so even if there's like some threat like a a perceived threat like a photographer lurking around they tend to ignore it because their food takes precedence so uh, and the lighting is also very good at um, the early mornings um and uh, again i think um, the but uh, while photographing at the early mornings or late evenings uh the thing that you have to uh, keep in mind is that the light level is too low and uh, you have to adjust your camera settings accordingly um these camera settings and the other things that you have to do to handle these special situations uh, i want to do it with a in a separate presentation because this is just about no why no why uh, a, part, a certain picture is good 
and uh, know how we'll be dealing it in a separate uh, presentation altogether. So I hope that answers your question. But for raptors, uh, usually midday is good because like that's when the raptors, when the thermals rise, that's when the raptors are active, particularly the Bonelli seagull and other birds, they're active during midday. So we can take advantage of the uh, midday also. We need not get restricted to uh, early mornings and late evenings alone. So raptors you can focus on in the midday. And the other question uh, that's asked here is that if the bird is partially in shadow and partially in light, how do we properly expose the bird? What metering mode should we use? Okay, so, um, you know, it's a, it's a very difficult, uh, a challenging situation. You know, when uh, the bird is partially, in, when the bird is completely in shadow, uh, I think we can go in for spot metering mode, uh, which, um, which is, which will give you like uh, good results. Um, spot metering mode, but when the when it's partially in shadow and partially in light, it is best not to take that uh, picture um, because. I do have like a um, um, picture which is taken and partially one, one half of the image is like uh, the highlights are blown out and the other half is completely in shadow. So this only happens when you are uh, trying to shoot in midday uh, or like, like let's say 9.30, 10 o'clock. So it's best to avoid the shooting at that time. Um, we don't get like pleasing images. Uh, the birds are also... Um, after they have fed, um, they are also like wary of their surroundings. They kind of uh, start to skulk. So, um, so I hope I've answered that question. So Baiju uh, has asked a question, rim light for aesthetic pictures. Do you, you missed out or for another session? Yeah, actually uh, the rim light um, or sill out, uh, rim light, sill out images uh, they make like uh, very good pictures also. Um, maybe in the like, uh, but actually they require a certain kind of an expertise on the camera and the settings as well. So I didn't want to deal um, with uh, those kind of uh, images in this presentation. When we are going to deal with the camera and the camera techniques for special uh, situations, I'll definitely um, uh, address that. So um, I think the time is also running out, folks. Thank you so much for joining us on a Sunday morning. I hope the presentation was useful. Please do uh, leave me a, uh, leave a feedback. Um, I, I'd uh, really appreciate because uh, these things are very valuable for improving the presentations. Thank you very much. Okay.